the key point got got it is it going to go away okay um so the key point is maybe okay i have a little pop up here on my screen but everything's fine there um so the key point is uh, since I'm focusing on topology associated with spin, um, atomic spin orbit coupling can have, actually have some really interesting um, effects here. So I'll, I'll specifically be focusing on um, two different kinds of skirmion phase that can occur in a tight binding model for superconducting uh, strontium ruthenate. Um, and what's really nice about this uh, relatively simple tight binding model is it, it gives you a chance to observe the two uh, different kinds of topological phase transitions uh, that are associated with uh, these phases so far. Um, and this is one of the like really important aspects of this work. So uh, the key point is, so remember, I'm focusing on effectively non-interacting topological phases. Uh, and even when we respect the symmetry protecting the topological phase, there are actually two different kinds of uh, phase transitions uh, for these um, for this topology. So type one uh, is uh, a, a phase transition that occurs with the closing of an energy gap. Um, but importantly, there's also type two, where you can actually have a topological phase transition under these conditions uh, without the closing of an energy gap. Instead, you can think of um, the magnitude of the spin uh, going to zero uh, somewhere in the Brillouin zone. And this allows uh, for the topological phase transition um, and this type two is quite important uh, to my knowledge. It's the first contradiction of what's called the flat band limit assumption that is used very widely in study of topological uh, condensed matter physics uh, going even back to the early eighties. Um, all right, so I just want to quickly acknowledge um, uh, collaborators on uh, the, the second work. So uh, especially my student, um, Shu Wei, uh, who's uh, done a lot of work uh, on this stuff, he's he's being very brave, <laughs> and um, he, he's he's really you know uh, the person who like helped make this happen. Um, and I'd also really like to acknowledge one of the uh, postdocs at um, the Max Planck Institute's uh, Lee Kun, uh, who uh, really helped a lot in understanding uh, some of the the fundamentals of of this topology. Um, oops, yeah, okay. So this is a sort of title screen just for part one. Um, and that's, yeah, the archive number. All right, so uh, as motivation, um, because, yeah, I think the way to motivate this is to first ask, why am I calling these topological skirmion phases of matter? Um, and I think the best way to try to explain that is to start from uh, the examples of skirmions that are probably uh, most widely known in condensed matter physics, which are actually uh, these magnetic skirmions. Um, so the, the key point is, um, in real space, you can have uh, textures um, in your, uh, of local moments, basically, uh, that are actually uh, topological in a certain sense. So, um, and this is, you know, an area of research that's been studied very intensely and very widely for a long period of time. Um, people have been very interested in these skirmions. Uh, as, for instance, a platform for very dense uh, data storage, but there are, of course, a, a lot of other interesting physics associated with them. Um, but what is a skirmion, first of all? So um, it's basically this uh, sort of texture at the simplest level, um, and you can think of it as being topological in, this, in the following sense. Uh, you can think of mapping uh, these moments um, based on their orientation to the surface of a sphere and basically, for instance, if we start at the uh, boundary of the skirmion, you see that the spin is pointing up. Um, and then as we move inwards, it tips into, let's say, the xy plane, and it winds by 2 pi. And finally, at the center, it's pointing down. So this corresponds to basically a wrapping of the sphere uh, exactly once. Um, and the key point is these skirmions are uh, like spin or local moment textures. Uh, that wrap the sphere some integer number of times, at least when you're looking at these what are called baby skirmions. Um, and you can think of it as uh, topological in the sense that you would have to poke a hole in this spin texture in order to change the number of times the texture wraps the sphere. Um, so where is that topology coming from? This is uh, an important question 
in order to explain um, the work uh, that I'm really going to focus on, which is about uh, momentum space fermions, not real space fermions. Um, well, we can think of, um, you know, the orientation of the spins uh, changing uh, very slowly on the scale of the lattice spacing, and then we can write down some continuum model uh, for the system and, you know, uh, start with, you know, a fairly simple model that includes like an exchange term. Um, and uh, in the more traditional cases, people look at the case of skirmions resulting from the breaking of inversion symmetry. Uh, which leads to this uh, Zelazinski Maria term. And then there's a third term, um, which basically is a, just a, like a Zeeman field term or something like this. Um, and the key point is uh, I need to show you the Hamiltonian because uh, the topology can be thought of as um, uh, resulting from the fact that the Hamiltonian serves as a mapping, um, you, you could say naively from real space to the two sphere in uh, computing the, the magnetization texture. But uh, really it's, uh, you have to do um, a little bit of uh, gymnastics, but really it's the mapping from projective real space, which you could think of as like punctured real space uh, to the two sphere that um, you can actually think of being uh, like contractible to the mapping from say the two sphere to the two sphere. Um, and we um, basically can think about these mappings um, sometimes from one, one space to another as, uh, you know, being, you can divide them basically into topologically distinct, uh, sectors. And we can, uh, think about classifying that using a homotopy group. Um, and the key point is the homotopy groups that we are most familiar with, um, are the homotopy groups of spheres. So it's really important to try to kind of whatever, uh, mappings we're really looking at somehow bringing them to the homotopy groups of uh, mappings from the some like n sphere to an m sphere, in which case we can uh, classify the system topologically using this homotopy group. Uh, so uh, before I was talking about the idea that the spin texture can wrap the sphere some integer number of times, this um, results basically from the homotopy group calculation. And you can actually uh, then start to characterize the topology in terms of uh, an invariant of the following form, at least for the case of the baby skirmions. Um, so basically you can uh, find some expression for what we call a curvature uh, in terms of the magnetization vector at different points in real space. Um, and performing an integral over real space, you can determine um, a topological charge, a topological invariant, which is basically the number of times the texture wraps the sphere. Um, so basically, uh, an interesting thing, at least from my perspective, uh, and I'm not uh, focused on real space skirmions at all, but from my perspective, what's really interesting is uh, the emphasis in studying these uh, real space uh, skirmions, really like spin skirmions or like magnetic skirmions, the emphasis on the topological magnetic textures in the bulk. Uh, unlike the case, cases that I'm more familiar with, which are the, the topological insulators, um, where you really focus a lot on uh, what's called the bulk boundary correspondence. So the idea there is that you have some system that's insulating in the bulk, um, but as a result of some non-trivial value for a topological invariant of the bulk, uh, you expect uh, topologically protected gapless surface states. So I'm just showing the example, for instance, of a three-dimensional topological insulator protected by uh, time reversal symmetry. Um, and for me, uh, this really brings up the question of like, when can spin skirmions have more direct consequences analogous to a bulk boundary correspondence? Um, because you can think of them possibly leading to a bulk boundary correspondence in, a, in an indirect way. For instance, there is what's known as the topological Hall effect uh, that results for systems with these real space skirmions um, where itinerant electrons moving around against this background of uh, spins or local moments, um, basically when there is strong Hund's coupling, uh, their spins want to align with these local moments. And as a result of this, um, these itinerant electrons pick up a, a berry phase that, that can lead effectively to uh, uh, one version of an anomalous Hall effect or the quant even the quantum anomalous Hall effect. But what I'm really interested in, just, yeah. Just a moment of clarification, because there are two different types of homotopies here. One, Classified defects in real space, which you talked about, and another 
which has emerged in the context of topological insulators, uh, where we're classifying things in momentum space. And, and all this is the latter that had a fast boundary correspondence. Yeah, you're so right. Boundary correspondence with conventional magnetic experiments. So I'm a bit confused about which you're referring to when you say fast boundary. Yeah, so basically in this case, and I was going to get into this, I think in the next, yeah, in the next slide, um, but basically uh, you start with this uh, magnetic skirmion um, resulting from this particular kind of mapping, basically from projective real space. Um, but then you can think about the momentum space uh, sort of topology of the itinerant electrons against this background. And this is what leads to the bulk boundary correspondence, uh, for instance, in the case of the topological Hall effect. Um, all right, yeah, but I'm really interested in. Does the presence of real space defects modify the bulk boundary correspondence between momentum space and the surface? Um, is that, is that I don't really think so. Like, I really think you can just, at least in the case of the topological Hall effect, you can really think of just you picked up a berry phase and you can think about the consequences of the basically the berry phase, which so, so it's the same. Uh, I would say, oh, sorry. So, are you introducing the real space experiments as a as a pedagogical step. Yes, really. Um, yeah, uh, maybe I'll just go. So I could comment on your question here. Yeah. Can they quantum ball semions to um they project onto those and their level? The bulk boundary correspondence is very clear to the formal correspondence. And there the the, the skermion is a type of a charge and it doesn't that's a context where it's the real space nature of those skirmions seem more clearly that it's going to change in the world. Um, all right. So, yeah, so um, there is actually an example that we know of already where a uh, spin skirmion uh, leads to very directly to a bulk boundary correspondence. It's actually the case of a, a two band uh, churn insulator. Um, for instance, uh, if you consider a block Hamiltonian of the following form, uh, basically you can compute uh, the churn number that's associated with um, the mappings uh, from the two torus to the two sphere, which you can uh, contract uh, to mappings from the two sphere to the two sphere. And then again, you can think about the homotopy group that I showed previously. Um, you, you can, uh, that, that, actually can be written, for instance, if you start from the Kubo formula for um, the Hall connectivity, uh, you can massage it in the two band case such that it is actually a skirmion number, a lot like uh, the one that I showed previously for, for real space. Um, the key point is this is actually very particular uh, to two band uh, block Hamiltonians. Um, and here I just like to, um, I think this is a, a cute example uh, from some of my past work with Professor Arun Paramakanti, um, where basically we, we found a, a very nice uh, two-band block Hamiltonian that realizes churn number uh, of two or minus two uh, for individual bands. Um, and we plotted the basically ground state spin texture, or you could think of it as a pseudo spin texture uh, over the Brillouin zone, uh, where the, the first Brillouin zone is highlighted by this black hexagon. And you can see, for instance, that the spin or pseudo spin is pointing down at the corner of the Brillouin zone. As you move inwards, it tips into this kx, ky plane, and it actually winds by four pi uh, around the, the gamma point, uh, the center of the Brillouin zone, before finally pointing up at the end. So, you know, this is something that has been known for a long time. Uh, but the key point is, um, this uh, spin skirmion number is not uh, equal to the total churn number um, in general, however. But in the picture, you always have the skirmion in the center of the Brillouin zone, always one, right? But the, the wrapping number can, can change. I'm sorry? So, so in momentum space, you have uh, the skirmion located always in the center. It's not like real space skirmions that uh, could, could pop up anywhere in space. Um, well, one thing that can happen, for instance, with that two band model is if you um, add in uh, interactions, even at a mean field level, you can realize a nematic phase um, where you're uh, in that case, like a charge single charge two skirmion can split apart um, into two charge one skirmions that are 
existing at like uh, plus, plus k and, and minus k, where k is uh, finite in, in magnitude. Um, so it is possible to move them around a little bit, but I would say they are much more constrained. And I mean, yeah, I, again, I haven't thought a lot about real space skirmions, but um, there's a, a tremendous variety uh, of different kinds. And I would say that instead, if you're thinking about momentum space skirmions, uh, they seem to be much you know, simpler. It doesn't seem to be as much of a zoo um, of different kinds of uh, textures. Um, so the key point I wanted to make was that uh, if we go to uh, block Hamiltonians with more than, than two bands, um, we can still think about skirmions, but not skirmions necessarily of spin. Although, of course, if you had like an SUN uh, model, you could uh, still think about um, a, a spin skirmion. But what we really actually think about for effectively non-interacting systems is um, the topology associated with mappings from the Brillouin zone to what is called the space of flatband Hamiltonians or the space of projectors, uh, basically onto the ground state. Um, and you can actually think about um, a skirmion forming in this projector texture uh, over the Brillouin zone instead. Um, and so the key point is uh, this uh, approach to classifying topology and uh, understanding topology uh, relies on something called the flat band limit assumption, um, basically. So the idea is that if you start with some uh, Hamiltonian with dispersive bands um, with some set of topological invariants, so people might naively think of just like one topological invariant characterizing a system, but considering how complicated things are getting uh, these days, I think you really have to be careful and potentially think about a set of topological invariants characterizing a system. Um, the idea is uh, you can, uh, you don't have to worry about trying to uh, characterize the topology of all of the uh, dispersive Hamiltonians. You can uh, think about adiabatically deforming them, so without the closing of any energy gaps, to some flat band counterpart. Uh, and if you don't change the occupancy of the bands and you're respecting the symmetry protecting the topological phase, the idea is that you can compute topological invariance for this flat band counterpart and you're uh, guaranteed basically that um, the values for each of the corresponding topological invariants in the dispersive system have the same value. Uh, and this is why uh, we uh, are, you know, uh, we are able to just think about characterizing things in terms of these mappings from the Brillouin zone to uh, the space of projectors. Um, so this really brings me to, I guess, the, the question associated with uh, this, uh, these talks is really when can we uh, still think about characterizing topology that will very directly lead to a bulk boundary correspondence? Um, in terms of spin skirmions rather than uh, projector skirmions beyond the cases that we know of. Um, and when is the spin skirmion, what, what this question really means is we, we need to understand when you can have a spin skirmion uh, associated with the ground state, uh, even if you have additional degrees of freedom besides just spin, say an, an orbital degree of freedom. Um, and by this point, maybe <laughs> I can explain the terminology a little bit better. So I use skirmion here uh, in the sense of spin skirmion, um, in the sense that this very like large community in condensed matter physics uh, very usually <laughs> kind of casually refers to their magnetic skirmions. Um, and I use topological here to kind of indicate the fact that I'm thinking about uh, skirmions, spin skirmions um, that have a very direct uh, bulk boundary correspondence. Um, and maybe what I would say is also like this, uh, th this name is really not for the people who specialize in thinking about uh, these kinds of uh, things. It's for everyone else. Um, for uh, that very small community, I would say you could possibly think of calling it a skirm insulator. The problem is then there's some redundancy in the literature because I think peers called something else uh, basically uh, this, um, but I encourage people to uh, borrow it and use it <laughs> in casual discussion uh, for this physics. All right, so when can we have those spin skirmions, uh, even if we have additional degrees of freedom? Well, it turns out that you can actually uh, um, achieve this if you have certain symmetry protection. So if you actually have some generalized particle hole symmetry um, where the 
operator for this um, generalized particle hole transformation is this C prime, uh, which you can actually express as the product of the particle hole operator where C squares to minus one and the spatial inversion operator I. Uh, and one really nice thing, so just believe me for a second that this is the case, but one really nice thing about this is that then you already have a sense of where to look for this topology. Uh, basically, um, you know, it, you, you would expect it potentially in centrosymmetric superconductors um, where you have uh, C and I symmetry individually and therefore would also expect the system to have um, the, the product symmetry as well. Um, so basically to have block Hamiltonians uh, that uh, have this generalized particle hole symmetry, um, they have to satisfy the following relation where J takes the following form in terms of the N by N identity matrix. Um, and then the key thing is uh, you could, um, you know, go to this flat band limit and think about um, trying to find the topological classification according to the tenfold way for this uh, Hamiltonian. And basically uh, you get the following Pamatvi group. Um, so pi to sp2n over un, where sp2n is the compact symplectic group, which is the intersection of the complex symplectic group and the special unitary group. Uh, and un is the unitary group. And you get integer classification for the topology associated with the projectors. Um, but what was uh, missed previously is that this quotient can actually act on other observables besides the projectors. Uh, specifically, it can actually act on spin, which you could kind of uh, convince yourself of, you know, based on what I told you about the form of the compact symplectic group, the fact that it's the intersection uh, with the, the special unitary group. Um, and so there's actually a, a separate topology associated with the mappings from the Brillouin zone um, to, you could say, the space of spin. Um, and what's, yeah, very interesting is this, this topology can be completely independent of the topology associated with the projectors. Um, and another interesting point here is that um, this uh, quotient of Lie groups doesn't act on orbital or total angular momentum in general. Uh, for instance, if you have crystal field splitting, um, the, the symmetry is reduced already so much for those observables that you certainly can't think about uh, this quotient acting upon them. Um, and actually it's possible for um, like a, any homotopy group associated with the orbital or total angular momentum uh, to be trivial. And you basically have instead just non-trivial topology associated with the mappings to projectors and the mappings to spin. Um, here I could say something. <laughs> Uh, so some people might be concerned about the idea of topology associated with some object that might not be conserved. Uh, for instance, if you had non-negligible non atomic spin orbit coupling and you have an orbital degree of freedom and spin, uh, you might for some reason think, but why, you know, how can you possibly have topology associated with this object that is not uh, conserved? Um, that isn't the point. Uh, the point is simply, you know, is spin acted upon basically by uh, a quotient that will yield a non-trivial homotopy group or not. It's really just about uh, the symmetry, not about conservation of some observable. And this actually leads to really interesting uh, consequences. One last thing I'd like to mention at this point. Before we go on, uh, a very hard concept, this quotient. Quotient is um, I don't know off the top of my head the full set of quotient groups for the, the well, ten, 10 symmetric spaces. Yeah, well, at least in the case of the tenfold way, um, the, the point is to um, go to this flat band counterpart. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically you can restrict the, you, you can identify the form basically of the matrix representation associated with this flat band Hamiltonian. Um, and this allows you basically to identify uh, which quotient is, is relevant. Um, and yeah, in this case, basically the symplectic structure you could already kind of see from the fact that I'm effectively talking about superconductors. 
Um, and you could sort of see that we would remove some degrees of freedom, which is what the, the quotient is telling you, uh, uh, because of the basically relation between particle and whole. So um, I don't know, this is, okay, but what I would say is, uh, Yeah, um, one thing I would say is in the case of the spin operator, you can sort of just kind of see it from the expression of, of the operator, um, that this is the uh, quotient that would act upon it. Um, Are there other examples where a quotient acts on something other than spin? Um, in considering, not, not for considering mappings from the full Brillouin zone. Um, at least to to some other space. Uh, this is the first, um, to my knowledge, first example of thinking about mapping from from that space, the full Brillouin zone, to uh, to something other than the projectors. Um, but this is a good point. I do not think that spin is the only observable that where you might have this sort of non-trivial topology. And this is going to be a huge uh, thing, I think, to think about going forward. Um, you can think about, uh, though, like mapping, say, from uh, just the Fermi surface um, to, to spaces of other observables. I think this is a bit more standard. Uh, for instance, thinking about like mapping to order parameters, um, something like this. Do you think it might be possible where there are physical systems where the quotient can act on the Oh, yeah. Um, so, like, you can have a, a case where um, you're so limited in the number of orbitals that you have that you really don't, um, I guess, uh, have to worry about uh, crystal field uh, splitting that would reduce the symmetry. Um, and in that case, you could certainly already expect uh, th this sort of non-trivial topology um, with this other, other degree of freedom. Um, and one last thing I just want to mention here um, for people that think a lot about like um, local moment models is uh, if you consider the, the smallest n case, n equal one, um, the quotient uh, takes the following form. Uh, and there are, there's basically an isomorphism um, from SP2 to SU2. Um, so for people who think a lot about, you know, like SU2 uh, Heisenberg model or something like this, it might be interesting to think about um, a generalization not to SUN, but instead to like um, SP, SPN instead. Uh, all right, so uh, I think it's helpful to think about uh, some toy models now. So the simplest case that is non-trivial is actually the four band case, um, because of course I, I told you previously that the case of the two band uh, churn insulator is, is one where you're uh, I guess invariant associated with the projectors is also the invariant associated with spin. And this is of course, because spin is your only degree of freedom in that case. So a four band model is, is the simplest case where things get interesting. Um, and basically I'm going to tell you about uh, the simplest example of a chiral, what I call chiral topological skirmion phase. Um, and I, I, I call it that because you could really think of it as a sort of generalization of a two band uh, churn insulator. Um, and you can actually construct models uh, very simply in terms of a, a two, some two-band churn insulator, basically, if you're, you know, trying to find a non-trivial uh, topology associated with spin. So you can basically just take uh, some two-band block Hamiltonian, such as the, the one shown here, um, and its C prime partner. So uh, just for some more intuition about the C prime symmetry, it acts in almost the same way um, uh, as C, except you do not take K to minus K, um, which will become important later. Um, and in this case, uh, then you have to, um, you know, identify the operators for spin that you would use to try to compute uh, this, this ground state spin texture. Um, so they can uh, take the following form in this case. They're basically the spin operators for uh, the guillebov Jens Hamiltonian, actually, because um, the spin operator is not momentum dependent. Uh, and so these are basically the different uh, Pauli matrices. Um, and then basically you can, so I'm showing an example for half filling of this four band system. 
you can basically compute the ground state spin expectation vector at particular uh, points in the Brillouin zone, which is, uh, and then you can normalize it, which is this uh, s hat s hat k here, uh, and then you can uh, write an expression for a curvature in terms of this uh, spin and compute a skirmion number. Um, this four band Hamiltonian is formally it's one of the cases of the tenfold way, but normally it's put under a superconducting category that you are now changing indices around and interpreting it differently. Is that what you're doing? Um, I'm not changing anything. Um, the point is that the tenfold way mm -hmm. is considering mappings from the Brillouin zone to the space of projectors. So there's a, some topology associated with that particular mapping. And I'm just considering a different mapping to a different um, observable, the spin. Um, and there's additional topology associated with that mapping that can be independent of the what. Yeah, what I'm telling you is that it's not. I'll explain. I'll explain further to you. Yeah. But the topological property is not carried by the individual band, right? So it's it's defined uh, in the real zone, but you can't uh, really attribute this to some sure number of individual bands, is this right? Yeah. Uh, so this is actually something that was talked about very briefly in uh, work by Avron, Seiler, and Simon in the early 1980s. Um, they were basically saying that if you have a matrix representation for the Hamiltonian, you could think about an additional non-trivial topology associated with um, uh, basically the mapping from, say, the Brillouin zone to this, uh, this other space. And they called it a global topological invariant, which I interpreted as indeed a topology associated with like all of the uh, occupied bands rather than individual bands. But if this topological index is non-zero, um, is it necessarily a requirement that, that some of the bands need to carry a turn on as well? Um, so the cases that I have looked at are cases where um, you can at least have a stable total turn number, but there is a case in for the strontium ruthenate model, for instance, where you have zero total turn number and non-zero skirmion number. Um, and more generally, I guess you would have to try to find um, some situation where um, you're mapping from, I, I'm not even sure if you could, but naively you would have to find a situation where you're mapping from the Brillouin zone to the projector was trivial. Oh, actually you could for a particular dimension. So you, you would want to find a case where you're mapping from the Brillouin zone to the space of projectors had trivial classification, um, but you're mapping from the Brillouin zone to the space of spin had non-trivial classification. Uh, and in that case, you, you wouldn't have a stable um, quantized expression for the invariant associated with the projectors, uh, only with the spin. Um, but that's not a case that I've actually uh, looked at yet. Um, yeah, so I'm just trying to show you this uh, example of the ground state spin texture, uh, even for this very simple model. Um, so basically uh, above I'm showing the in-plane components of the spin and I just like, I realize the, the arrows are very small so I just blew it up for you. Um, and you indeed see the winding by two pi. Um, and this is the out of plane component, which you indeed see also winds and you basically have a skirmion of charge one. Um, and what's nice at the four band level is there are actually 10 different symmetry allowed Kronecker products of Pauli matrices. Uh, so you can add additional like block off diagonal terms as well. Um, yeah, and uh, of course we're always interested in like, you know, experimentally relevant uh, cases um, and that generalized particle hole symmetry all by itself is kind of weird. Uh, but I did tell you that um, it already suggests we would want to look at centrosymmetric superconductors as possible hosts for this topology. Um, and there's actually a really nice way uh, to, to kind of guarantee uh, that this will happen. So basically, um, if you consider your Beguliebov de Gens Hamiltonian for a su superconductor as follows, where this bar epsilon k is the expression for the normal state Hamiltonian and uh, delta k is the superconducting gap function. And the key point is you, uh, you just need um, a normal state Hamiltonian that's even in momentum. In that case, you, you basically have um, like var epsilon k and its C prime partner on, on the block diagonal. 
um, as well as the particle hole, um, the whole count uh, partner basically of our epsilon k, um, because then uh, you know var epsilon of minus k is var epsilon k. For, for your experiment, texture, uh, don't you get instantaneous behavior around the edge of your Brillouin zone? Um, so what I would say is for baby skirmions, 2D skirmions, you don't have um, singularities. Uh, it's when you go to full skirmions, like hedgehogs, that you can actually trap uh, singularities. And for the texture you just showed, um, it's like uh, it's discontinuous at the edge of your real world. You, you have the same charge skirmion. Um, oh, I think the, cons the confusion might be here that you see like a very tiny arrow here, um, but it's basically zero. And it's the it's the z component that is non-zero there, and so there is no singularity because it's down on all four sides of the of the Brillouin zone. So it's just an artifact of uh, the the plot, basically. Um, so can we think about the x here as real string or not? Oh yeah. Um. So. The cases that I'm, yeah, so basically you can think of it as a real spin, um, but it could also be some pseudo spin that the key point is that it's acted upon by the appropriate yeah, quotient. It looks like it would be very odd to be a real spin. Very odd? Odd to be a real spin, just the way you've written this Hamiltonian. Um, I don't see why, because you could think about um, the degree of freedom associated with this two band block Hamiltonian being like a uh, spin up and spin down. Um, and basically, I'm computing the ground state spin texture associated with that degree of freedom when I write the spin operator as follows. Yeah. Um, all right. So one example of such a, a var epsilon that's even in momentum is the, the following, um, a little two-band block Hamiltonian for a churn insulator that only realizes a churn number of plus or minus two uh, for the lower band. Um, and uh, for instance, you can consider a variety of different superconducting gap functions. Um, I'm just showing one example of a spin triplet pairing with the following D vector. And uh, now we can begin to compute phase diagrams basically for uh, our toy models. Um, and I'm just showing you one example of a spin triplet uh, superconductor with the normal state that I showed on the previous slide. Um, and basically, I'm showing you phase diagrams as a function of the pairing strength and uh, some. Uh, basically hopping integral uh, for the model. Um, and I'm showing you the total churn number assuming half filling and the skirmion number, and also the minimum direct superconducting gap and the minimum ground state spin uh, magnitude. Because uh, the key point here is this um, skirmion topology is stable when the magnitude of your spin vector is uh, finite everywhere in the Brillouin zone. Um, and so basically you can already see some decoupling between the total churn number and the skirmion number here. So there's this region uh, where the churn number is four and the skirmion number is minus two. Um, and then um, I think that's, yeah, you can also see a bit of a fringe here, a blue fringe, um, but this uh, basically is, um, you know, just uh, an effect of the fact that the, the texture is actually unstable. Um, as a result of the spin going to zero somewhere in the Brillouin zone. And here's the case of the spin triplet superconductor that I was showing you previously. Uh, so again, we have this basically relation at the four band level um, and you can also like prove it analytically uh, for some simple cases at least um, that um, the total churn number for half filling is minus two times the skirmion number. Um, and here you can see uh, as well that at this level, you're only um, observing this type one topological phase transition where you have a closing of an energy gap. Uh, so you, you basically have to have a, a bit more freedom before you can see uh, the type two topological phase transition that I mentioned briefly. Um, an interesting thing here is of course that you have these triangular regions where the spin is finite everywhere in the Brillouin zone. And so the skirmion number is stable but you also have regions where it looks like the skirmion number is two. Uh, and again, you have this fringe, um, but it's not actually fully quantizing to an integer value because the magnitude of the spin vector is zero somewhere in these regions. 
But what's interesting is basically the, the system is forming what I call an omoskermion, or basically a skermion with uh, a, hole, a hole in it. Um, the vertical axis is a hopping integral. So it's like the, the strength of some kinetic term of the normal state. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm just showing you one control case here where uh, you can see a, a stable total turn number, but actually you've kind of set yourself up to have um, zero uh, ground state spin magnitude in the Brillouin zone everywhere in the phase diagram, uh, such that the skirmion number is uh, undefined. So this is just another example of the sort of decoupling that you can see at the four band level. Um, so what's really nice about looking at the, the four band models and getting some intuition for how you can, uh, for the recipes basically for constructing these toy models um, is that you can bootstrap off of some previously previous work to identify one of the bulk boundary correspondences for these topological phases. Um, basically, you can construct a 3D counterpart of what I could call the baby skirmion uh, uh, phases that I was talking about previously. The key point is that you want to start from some two-band block Hamiltonian that instead of realizing a baby skirmion, like a, a block Hamiltonian for a churn insulator, instead realizes a hedgehog, uh, so a full skirmion in 3D. And conveniently, there is such a block Hamiltonian. Um, it's the block Hamiltonian real, uh, realizing the Hopf insulator phase. Um, you can really think of that as like a, a 3D counterpart of a two-band churn insulator, uh, where you do actually see a hedgehog forming in the ground state spin or pseudo spin uh, in the case of that two-band model. And so you can basically just put that on the diagonal along with its C prime partner. Um, and you can compute spin using the operators as I showed previously. Uh, and in this case, um, indeed, say for uh, again, half filling, indeed you can see the, um, uh, the hedgehog structure. Here I'm just plotting the spin texture for two different uh, spherical shells of momentum, basically with, with different uh, radii. Um, and what's really nice is then we can bootstrap off of literature for the hop insulator where people found a very interesting sort of uh, bulk boundary correspondence previously. Um, so the key point was, you know, the Hopf insulator uh, originally was thought about as, um, you know, corresponding to some three-dimensional topological phase and you have some 3D Brillouin zone with uh, an X component, Y component, and Z component of momentum. Um, but what you can also do is uh, think of that Z component of momentum instead as some angle theta characterizing a defect in a two-dimensional system. Um, and you can basically express it in terms of say the X and uh, Y uh, coordinates. Um, and then when you have this non-trivial Hopf invariant, um, you actually see an unpaired Majorana zero mode lo uh, localized at the defect and another one localized at the boundary and specifically uh, for theta equals zero. Um, so it's uh, a bit unusual in this sense. We might have thought that you would see delocalized uh, topologically protected states on the boundary, but it, it really is localized to theta equals zero. Um, so to give you some intuition for that, because I, I think it is a little hard to imagine, uh, what's happening in the full 3D Brillouin zone is you have some hedgehog that's centered at the gamma point um, of, of the Brillouin zone, um, and it's effectively trapping a zero dimensional system uh, that you can think of as having a Z2 classification. And basically when it's in the odd parity state, you could think of it as effectively realizing um, uh, Majorana zero modes, but they're you know, at this basically right on top of one another. So in a sense, it's not very interesting, but when you consider these open boundary conditions um, by uh, expressing things in terms of this angle theta, you're effectively pulling those uh, Majoranas apart. You're spatially separating them such that you can you know, see the evidence of the unpaired uh, Majorana zero modes. Um, so I, again, I think it's hard to visualize, um, but first we can think about you know, what we kind of want to realize. We kind of want to realize effectively a, um, uh, a loop of one dimensional systems um, where for the KZ equals zero, um, this defect basically we have these uh, Majoranas uh, so this is effectively realized by considering these uh, 
exotic boundary conditions. Um, so here I'm just kind of showing the geometry, annulus geometry of the low energy theory. Um, and you can think about shrinking this hole in the center down until really it's just this defect at the center. In this case, I'm showing the, the lattice model. Um, and so basically you can see that the KZ equals zero line corresponds to this theta equals zero line. Um, and, and this is why we basically have this mode localized at, at um, one point on, on the edge. We're really effectively realizing a one dimensional uh, topological system within this uh, larger, larger system. And this is related to past work um, by Teo and Kane on the topological classification of defects. Um, so, we are now in, in discussion of time efficiently. So. Okay, I'm almost, almost done. I think I have a couple more slides. All right, so I'm just showing you some numerical evidence basically of this bulk boundary correspondence. Um, so here I'm just showing it in the case of the hop insulator. Uh, so indeed, if you do the numerical diagonalization, you get uh, states with some uh, probability density localized at the defect and at the boundary, and you can take linear combinations basically of uh, these two zero energy uh, states to realize your uh, localized unpaired Majorana zero modes. Um, and for comparison with the four band model for the 3D skirmion phase, I think it's uh, really helpful to imagine, um, so think of the wave function basically uh, for um, one of these localized states um, on, uh, on the lattice. You can basically think of it as an array of complex numbers and you can imagine plotting each of those complex numbers in the, in the complex plane. Um, and as you would expect uh, for a Majorana, um, this forms a straight line, which agrees with our idea of a Majorana being purely real up to some uh, phase degree of freedom. So in the four band case, you instead see four zero energy modes. Um, they're actually already localized uh, upon doing the numerical diagonalization. Um, and basically uh, two of them are localized at the defect and two of them are localized at the boundary. And if you examine them um, in the same way, uh, you actually see um, a cross-like structure in the complex plane. Um, and I should probably note, of course, the pollution of the state at the defect. Um, we think this is due basically to the fact that you have not just uh, theta equals zero physics there, but also theta non-zero effectively. Um, so these cross states are uh, quite unusual. Uh, if we thought just about the topological classification associated with the projectors, so pi three sp two n over u n, it's z two. Um, so what we would, uh, so how do I say this? In the low energy theory uh, for this model, you find that there are two Majoranas right on top of one another here, and one is purely real and one is purely imaginary. So these cross states are actually um, the most general complex uh, states um, allowed by the symmetries of the system. Uh, such that when you take the appropriate linear combinations, you realize um, these two Majoranas. Um, so this is not supposed to happen for a system with Z2 classification. You would expect them to hybridize and move away from zero energy, uh, but they are instead still at zero energy, uh, which is an indication basically of this extension of the topological classification uh, for the system by the additional uh, topology associated with mappings from the Berlin zone to spin. Um, and very quickly, I just want to talk about the second bulk boundary correspondence. So the idea is we can think of that block Hamiltonian with the C prime symmetry um, as describing um, uh, some isolated system with some number of degrees of freedom, in this case, a spin degree of freedom S, um, and then some other uh, set of degrees of freedom S bar, um, and we can really uh, reinterpret this block Hamiltonian um, as consisting of a spin system and an environment. It's a very small environment, but you could still think of it as an, env uh, an environment. And then we can imagine doing a partial trace over the S bar degrees of freedom, in which case we would reduce the non-trivial homotopy group down to the uh, N equal one case, uh, and also basically the homotopy group of a two band churn insulator. Uh, and this basically means that we would expect um, a, a bulk boundary correspondence analogous to that of the churn insulator upon performing this partial trace, upon ignoring these other degrees of freedom, basically for the non-equilibrium steady state of, of this uh, open system. 
Um, and so I just want to quickly mention basically some different options for experimental detection. Uh, so the first one would just be ARPES. Um, if you did spin ARPES, uh, basically you could try to um, image these spin skirmions in the same way that you image the uh, uh, spin momentum locking uh, of a Dirac cone on the surface of a 3D TI. Um, and then the other possibilities are maybe looking for uh, quantized transport signatures. Um, and if you are thinking about this, um, like ignoring some information basically about the system. And finally, you can also uh, think about um, probing the local density of states uh, to try to look for evidence of these cross zero modes. All right, and uh, yeah, so just as a summary, it is possible to have a very direct um, bulk boundary correspondence, various consequences uh, of topology associated not just with mappings from the Brillouin zone to the space of projectors, space of flat band Hamiltonians, but also uh, from the Brillouin zone to other, the spaces of other observables. And the case that I've looked at is spin, and you can achieve this when you have actually, I'd say, a, a, very, a fairly mundane symmetry in, in comparison to what people are looking at a lot of the time these days, this generalized particle hole symmetry, um, which you know, means that we can look for the sort of physics uh, in central symmetric superconductors. So it may be important basically to like revisit uh, problems associated with uh, central symmetric superconductivity to possibly understand how this additional topology that is basically there in a variety of models that we have already been looking at for a really long time. And we just didn't know that we should also be uh, characterizing topology in this way. Um, and then I've shown you, you can construct a variety of uh, toy models for the 2D systems, and you can use this to get intuition about how to construct the 3D counterpart of the skirmion phase. Um, and I've told you about these two different kinds of bulk boundary, cor uh, bulk boundary correspondence, basically. And so uh, at this stage, I just want to kind of say that uh, this indicates that uh, topological phases should not be associated just with the full set of degrees of freedom for the ground state, but rather also with various subsets of the degrees of freedom of the ground state. Thank you. Discussion. Uh, discussion. Quickly. So if there are um, questions from the audience, please uh, type in the chat or unmute yourselves. So um, I want to see if I've understood something here. So if there's two bands, then the spin necessarily is the projector band. Sorry, the spin necessarily can be zero on a band. It has to be plus or minus one or something. Correct. Um, if there's only two if, bands, if spin, if spin is band. your if spin is your twofold degree of freedom, yes. Um, then uh, yeah, you can think about uh, spin associated with the the block states. Yeah, um, but that's then the same as the projector, and therefore churn number. Exactly, because spin degree. is your only degree of freedom. Okay. Right. But then if there's more than two bands, you've got this extra degree of freedom. You can have it. You, you could also imagine just a, like SUN yeah. kind well, of spin. You always have more degrees of freedom. Yeah. Whether but, it's useful or not is another matter. But now you're saying that this extra degree of freedom, you can say you can define spin on this lower band degree example. And so long as this doesn't go to zero, it does something useful. And this doesn't necessarily have to be the same as the churn number. Um, so for your ground state, you can compute yeah. um, a spin texture and you can then compute a skirmion number, a winding number associated with this texture. Um, and it will be uh, stable uh, basically if the spin is finite in magnitude everywhere in the Brillouin zone. Okay. Um, and this can be independent of the topology associated with the full set of degrees okay. of freedom, which is the projector uh, topology. So the key point here, just to kind of like foreshadow what will come in the second talk um, is that uh, like I'm already basically telling you that what is protecting the topology um, in the case of this the the, the spin is the, the the spin vector there's a spin gap basically that must be yes. finite yeah. uh, to ensure that that topology is stable rather than an energy gap which is the case of the yeah, projectors okay. That's what I was thinking it was understanding so. yeah cool. okay so now my 
question to do with it. So another way I can think of this in this four band system is that the lower band is actually two bands, but they overlap in some way. Uh, say that again. I mean, if I just want to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, my ground state has two bands which are full. Yeah. Okay, but these will overlap in some way. I can't say there's an energy gap between them or anything like that. Yeah, not necessarily. Yeah. Like there, there could be band touchings. Okay, so um, I can think of individual spin on each of these bands, for example, or some things. I mean, and then sums together to make the whole ground state. And yeah, exactly. That's how you compute okay. the spin. Yeah. And then what's the condition for this to be an interface of logic number? Is it that these two bands don't touch? Because if they touch, this might then be the spin is not well defined or? Um, no, you have to have um, a finite energy gap basically between the occupied bands and the unoccupied bands. So in this sense, yeah, but I'm thinking of the, you've already got that in order to get an insulator. Now yeah. we're looking at just the lower band, which is really two bands mm -hmm. because you've got a four uh, sub yeah. lattice system or four yeah. whatever um, state system. Yeah, in this is case, you can on these lower two bands, they have to have an energy gap between them. No, no, no. In, in the same way that for the total churn number, you don't have to have an energy gap uh, yeah, necessarily exactly. you between get the total churn number. But then the spin thing, I would imagine that if these two bands touch at some point, then maybe it's less easy to define the spin at that point and it becomes not quantized. Or is that one way I can think of it? Or no? Um, no, it, no, it's okay. Um, okay. So there's yeah. something more subtle with the symmetry, meaning that the spin, the spin vector becomes fixed and quantized and stable. Um, I think the key point is it has to be acted upon by the appropriate quotient. Uh, that is a quotient that's associated with a non-trivial homotopy group. Yeah. If it's yeah, acted upon. Visualizing it. Yeah, I, um, okay. this is where yeah our topology kind of comes from it's from these yes. uh, mappings and uh, so you have to have a non-trivial um, homotopy group um, and that requires that you're mapping to some space where the object is acted upon by um, a certain uh, quotient of Lie groups sorry can you speak up Um, I would think of it really as you have like a particle degree of freedom and a whole degree of freedom, and they're basically like related to one another, and this leads to you basically pulling out uh, some freedom that's uh, got a matrix representation basically um, of basically the like the whole sector. I think I think it's this is what's most helpful for me is that you have you can think in terms of like a particle and a whole degree of freedom and the constraints the the relationship between them is what effectively leads to you pulling out this uh, UN structure. Yeah, but I think I try to understand this. Say it's something that can be observed. So, so I guess I'm what you said is you could have certain not insulators which have these you could have certain insulators which have uh this term you say this term you phase you mean that the, 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 in momentum space the spin expectation value becomes a spin yeah. mm -hmm. so does this term spectre have some observable consequences? Yeah, and that would be different from the ones that were produced by the old methods. Yeah, so the um, I think the one that I went into greater detail about was this um, bulk boundary correspond correspondence so associated with defects, defects, like or STM or something like this. So that's in momentum space. Or real space? No, 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 in real space. Okay. You have in th this geometry that I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, this is in real space. Okay. So imagine some two-dimensional system with some defect in real space. Okay. 
and then you can probe the local density of states to try to uh, search basically for uh, these cross modes. And basically the evidence that you uh, have more than Z2 classification. The key point was there are two Majoranas at the boundary of the system that are sitting right on top of one another. Um, and as a result of the additional spin topology, they are uh, actually prevented from hybridizing. And so we have more than just Z2 classification. But wouldn't the method with Q at the end give us that anyway? No, but because they were, again, just thinking about mappings from the Brillouin zone to projectors, they did not consider other observables. This is the issue. They focused only on the projectors. But there is topology beyond the tenfold way when you consider mappings from the Brillouin zone to other observables. Well, your particular example, can you can you explicitly write down the, the mapping from your four bands one from your for your four band model from the real zone to the to the spin space and, and explain how you define your super spin in this case? Um I mean you do I mean in a simple texture, but you haven't really told us what the what this the effect of super spin actually is and how it's made of uh, your four band model. Um, I, it was actually being mentioned here that yeah, you have these that. operators that I showed written in terms of the Pauli matrices in the four band case, and you can compute an expectation value at a particular point in momentum space um, with like the block states, say for the like one of the occupied bands to start with, to, to start with. and then you can compute the expectation value um, for the ground state uh, by summing over these expectation values for the, the different bands. In which space? Sorry? Pauli matrices in which space? I mean, is it some pseudo spin? It could be a pseudo spin. I'm just asking if it's maybe, if we can make it very precise what the particular four band model. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I showed you the operators that I was using in the four band cases. Um, and that would involve, you know, choosing a particular basis. But there is no underlying uh, type binding model of any sort or so that- I showed a bunch of type binding models. I showed the block Hamiltonians for a variety of type binding models. I, I considered um, a variety of block Hamiltonians uh, for, for type binding models. They could even be like microscopically derived type binding models, um, which is the case for the strontium ruthenate type binding model that I'll talk about in the on front tomorrow. Yeah, I'm just asking maybe the, the simplest possible realization that makes it <clears throat> easier to follow. Yeah, the, the simplest realization is the four band level and you have a block Hamiltonian for some two band churn insulator and you simply combine that with its C prime partner. And if you want to think about something that is more physically relevant, you can think about um, a two band model for a churn insulator uh, that is even in momentum. And then you can combine it with its um, like whole counterpart, which in that case is also the C prime part counterpart. But the key point is you can also add various block off diagonal terms. So basically you combine two conventional churn insulators. To, to yeah, that's what's hilarious about this. Um, I would say this problem has been like intuitively very difficult, but once you figure those things out, the constructions are actually very uh, simple. Then, then following up on Sophia's question about the classification, so what what exactly is missed in the traditional classification? Sure. The, I, mean, I, I, I understand that people didn't consider uh, the mapping to to uh, super spin space, but um... yeah. So this is the key point. They they focused only on mappings from the Brillouin zone to the space of the flat band Hamiltonians. But the point is that you can also have topology that is independent of that topology associated with mappings from the Brillouin zone um, to the space of other observables that could correspond to a topology of some subset of the degrees of freedom of the ground state. This, this is what they missed. Structure. Does it just live on top? So does the previous classification still hold that you have? Oh yeah, so space? that's basically the focus of the second talk. But um, I, I told you, I, I foreshadowed a little bit 
uh, talking about the flat band limit assumption that's used to construct the tenfold way. Um, and I, I told you that um, this topology is stable when you have a finite spin gap rather than an energy gap. And I, I told you basically that this, to my knowledge, is the first contradiction of the flat band limit assumption. So it, it was used to construct the tenfold way, but it doesn't hold in general. Um, and that assumption is used very widely, basically, in study of topological condensed matter physics. The earliest mention that I have seen is in this Avron, Seiler, and Simon paper from 1983 that I was talking about earlier. They actually use the flat band limit assumption there. So this is like, you know, um, a big issue potentially. I, like many other people in the audience, have a bit of confusion about this. Okay? The great thing about topological status is you can give a simple model, even if you don't understand the issues of the tenfold way, you can just put it on a Mathematica code and you can see the surface states. So, can you give me a, a model that comes from your new classification where I can just put it on and see it gives me something different? What the tenfold way gave me. And, and yeah, so this. Supposing I don't have an FTL, and I just want to look on my solution that I get by diagonalizing a Hamiltonian. What do I have to look for? Um, in, in the case of the Z2 topological status, it's just real simple. I just see an edge state. Okay. So, what do I look for here? Um, the Hamiltonian? Yeah, so the Hamiltonian um, it could be basically this where this is the hop insulator two band block hamiltonian i need to break the symmetry to do what i don't know the hop insulator do i need to break any symmetries uh no at the two band level it's an interesting example um of uh effectively a uh, topological phase protected by like no symmetry at all the key point is that it just um corresponds to um this hopf map um, and it has non-trivial topology associated with that. Sorry? So, so would, it, would, it, would it be a phase of helium three be an example of that? Just, just, just that, that, that has a hedgehog of a D vector around the Fermi surface. Is that it, what you're talking about? Um, I guess the key point there is that's a topology associated with the Fermi surface, and I'm talking about a topology associated with the entire Brillouin zone. Yeah. But uh, that or, or if you put it in a drone zone, the no, key I'm just asking for the simplest Hamilton. What yeah. does that Hamiltonian look like? The, the hop, I don't know what the hot insulator Hamiltonian looks like, but the simplest example of it. Um, I'm going to remember it right now. It's actually a fairly complicated two band type binding model, um, but it has only nearest neighbor hopping. Um, yeah. And it's a four by four dimensional Hamiltonian. The Hopf insulator Hamiltonian is two by two. Can you can't explain it, right? Maybe you can do next talk with Joe, but that would be useful. Yeah. I, maybe I can. My understanding of that. Now, so here's the tenfold way, which is principally taken up from bulk band structures, yeah. and consequently on the edge of the surface. But that's not a complete theory of defects. For defects, it's something more. If you have defects in the bulk, uh, then that's uh, additional topology. That, that, that was a you know, subject that many people have looked at, and you and in particular. And your contribution is another element of that defect classification. Is that a fair way to say what you're saying? No. <laughs> the point is that they were considering mappings to the projectors, and I'm considering mappings to spin. Okay, well, and this I has big consequences. That. Sorry? That. I'm trying to translate. OK. okay so, so the way I'm, I'm okay. trying to think of it is take yeah. a two band insulator between yeah. the two. You've got an energy gap, you've got a lower band. Yeah. Now, suppose it's four bands. So yeah. this lower band has two subbands in it somehow, but they're not overlapping with no energy gap. Yeah. You can, however, define something else, which isn't an energy, but a spin or something, which does have a gap between them, yeah. and therefore apply similar topological features 
to this study. That's my understanding. But, but what that's I'm not saying. a new topological. That's just a, that's a, new you know, that's a different of. application of a previous existing class. I mean, or to have something with a new topological. Oh, maybe maybe I something. You have to have some, uh, you know, some invariant or some some zero mode that's new. Right? This, is, well, this, this is a different invariant. But you're, it's expressed in it's it's expressed in terms of the ground state spin rather than the projector. So there's been like I get you know an effort to find additional topology by considering say different symmetries, um, and instead I'm just talking about uh, considering basically a different observable. The classification is independent of observable. That's the existing state classification. The classification was for a specific observable. It was for the flat. No, it was for the flat band Hamiltonian. It's specifically for that observable. There's many other ways of getting classification other than the fact that. Well, that's what the tenfold way is based on. This is what our topology associated with mappings from the full Gerlon zone is based on for effectively non interacting systems. I'm happy to talk with you um, about it further. So, yeah, thank you. I'm not, I'm just, yeah, I'm not questioning your results. I think they're very nice. Just trying to understand yeah. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, you you have such a, a nice quiet voice, but Um, I haven't uh, thought about um, this. Uh, I've thought about it really in this more, you know, like uh, condensed matter setting. Um, but I'd be happy to get, you know, references from you um, um, about that. When you mentioned that um, they get partial effects, that's not it is, do you come into any trouble with that, like getting? Does it need to be diagonalized first and then you partial principle? Or is it, does it, could you end up something which doesn't doesn't uh, give you invariant because it doesn't have a um, Maybe the more intuitive thing is to think about the C prime symmetry guaranteeing that you will have this skirmion for the ground state spin over the Brillouin zone. And then you could think about performing the partial trace, um, thinking about that texture, and you would expect this to be retained upon performing the partial trace. Okay, I think a quick question. Let's, uh, let's uh, thank Ashley again, and we're looking forward to. It's not possible to, let's say, have the four band model uh, without the uh, sternum texture. Just uh, put it on a script, uh, like you said, calculate the, the spectrum, the, the F states, and then compare uh, with the situation where you just put the